Good morning. We welcome in the name of Jesus Christ on this beautiful May morning. It is, as you may know, Mother's Day, and we are so glad that you are starting your day worshiping with us here at Second Christian. Whether you are gathered here in person or worshiping with us online, we are so very glad you are starting your day off with us here. We are delighted to have our second Sunday jazz trio back, plus one. Um, we have our regulars, Jim Rudolph, Rob Gary, and Mike Effenberger, and today uh, Eric Claxton is joining them. You may have heard the saxophone, um, which is a, a uh, familiar, but uh, a sound we haven't heard in a while, so thank you for being here today. This morning they're going to be sharing some of the uh, music of Cedar Walton. How many of you have heard of Cedar Walton before? Yeah, okay, you guys. Um, again, um, we, I'm not going to give you a, a uh, jazz uh, theory lesson today um, to follow up on last month's um, jazz theory lesson, but um, it, we're, we're learning new stuff every time and uh, thank you so much for, for digging deep and, and helping us to uh, uh, learn to appreciate different composers and different uh, types of jazz music. We are still holding to our mask optional uh, policy if you are fully vaccinated, but we do ask you uh, when we stand to sing to please mask up again and um, I know Several of you are, are still using the mask optional policy, and we are a mask-affirming congregation. So if you feel like you want to stay masked, you are welcome to. For Mother's Day, we have kicked the women out of the kitchen, mostly. Thank you, Melissa, for making the coffee today. Um, but we invite you downstairs for a time of refreshment and fellowship um, hosted by some of the men in our church. Let us continue in our worship. Our call to community is printed in our bulletin. Let us read responsibly. We gather once more as a great multitude. From various peoples and places, we have come. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power be to our God. We gather once more to shout Alleluia. Salvation belongs to the Holy One. We gather to worship day and night, the one who guides us to the springs of life. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power be to our God. Please stand as you are able as we sing our opening hymn, number 227, In the Garden. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray our gathering prayer. God, our good shepherd, restorer of our souls, the one who calls us to rest in green pastures, we enter this moment of worshipful gathering, trusting that you will guide us along the path of righteousness. Wherever we may be in this world, let us know your comforting presence. We are expectant, O oh God, that our fears will fade, our cups will overflow, and your goodness and mercy will accompany us in this hour and beyond. Now let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Thank you. 
goodness. <clears throat> our prayer for illumination is printed in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Make ancient words new and lost hopes rise again as you speak the promise to us this day. O spirit of truth, O life-giving breath. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Let us listen for the word of God. Now there was at Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which means Dorcas or gazelle. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, entreating him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he had come, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. Then turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, gave her his hand and lifted her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Let us listen also for the word of God as it comes to us from the book of the Revelation to John in the seventh chapter beginning at verse nine. After this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands, they cried out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. He said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here ends the reading of the lessons. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding of these words.
A couple of months ago, our friend Stu Diaz invited me to participate in the most recent iteration of Electric Voices. And for those of you who do not know what Electric Voices is, it's a production of the Theater for the People, and it is uh, spoken word, musical accompaniment, and um, after that, discussion of sometimes difficult subjects. So I was one of three pastors that he had invited to read their favorite verses from the book of Revelation. I said yes, even when he had planned to do it on Easter Sunday at 7 o'clock. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed, and it was rescheduled to the following Sunday evening. So a couple of weeks ago, I read my favorite verses from the book of Revelation. Now, asking a UCC pastor, at least this UCC pastor, what their favorite verses of Revelation are is like asking them, what's your favorite dental procedure? that's a little too extreme but it's just not something in my wheelhouse I know it's necessary but I don't necessarily look forward to it during that program Stu asked us all what our first encounter with the book of Revelation was like Anybody want to share their first encounter with the book of Revelation? Oh, fine. <laughs> Growing up in a mainline Protestant church in an upper middle class community, I had no recollection of anything from Revelation until I made it back to seminary for the second time. 
You'll probably hear more about that if you want to hear about my seminary education later. But at least there was nothing outside of the fact that there were some pretty otherworldly creatures, that their images of apocalypse and lakes of fire, and kind of kept the book of Revelation at arm's length. It's in there, but we really don't have to deal with it. The few verses that I was familiar with, I heard at funerals and memorial services and still use to this day. And we heard a little bit of a prelude to them because the verses that I read usually are from chapter 21. We read from verse 7 this morning, but here's the, here's the words or some of what I read from chap chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. These are beautiful, hope-filled, comforting words that are wonderful for us to feel and know at difficult times in our lives. But when Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series started coming out in the 1990s, the idea of prophecy and the prophecies in Revelation became quite the rage. It was pop culture then. And it forced many of us to learn more about it. So when Andover Newton offered a class, I decided it was time and I jumped in. It turns out that Revelation is not a prediction of the future. It is a vision of heaven. It was written to offer a word of encouragement and hope and sometimes challenge to the church, to seven particular churches. In a world in which it was sometimes dangerous to be a Christian, John's vision promised the ultimate victory of the faithful and the defeat of evil. And he describes over and over again what is to come, these throne room visions. It's telling us what is to come, not in this world, but in the next. And it doesn't guarantee an end to the painful experiences of this world. It's quite the opposite. He tells us that sometimes faithfulness can be hard. It can test our relationships. And it's also a reminder of what and who should be the subject and object of our worship. What demands our allegiance. That, of course, is God. Not empire, not power, not wealth, not safety. Not all those things that we consider blessings in our lives. But God. And it also points us to who and what we are supposed to be. Revelation is a series of seven visions that are revealed by the opening of seven seals. And what we heard today is, the part, is, is part of the interlude between the sixth and the seventh, just before the last seal is opened. And the opening of this final seal will initiate the final judgment. Now remember, this is a vision. And right before all heaven breaks loose, everything turns upside down. And we witness this scene of a great multitude worshiping God in heaven. Everyone was there. All nations and tribes, all races and languages, and they were waving palm branches, standing before the throne, singing John goes out of his way to tell us 
again and again that all the people are in this multitude. All the people. Everyone. Each of us bringing our own gifts and abilities. Can you see it? We don't know a whole lot about Tabitha. We heard about her in today's reading from Acts. She's in these few verses, and then we don't hear from her again. But there are a few notable details that Nadine gave us this morning that might help us glean some insight into who she is and the role she played. This section from Acts is right in the middle of some miracle accounts performed by Peter. And it also follows closely on the conversion of Saul, Paul, whose ministry, you may recall, was specifically directed for people outside the covenant, outside the community, outside the Jewish people. And we're also just a few verses before Peter's vision on Simon the Tanner's roof. At the, at the end of the reading today, Peter goes to stay with a certain Simon a Tanner who is outside of the community because A, tanning is smelly business and he was unclean because he was a tanner. He could not be part of the community. And Peter went and stayed with him and had this vision, right? The sheet coming down with all these unclean foods and God saying, no, 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 eat. It's all good. So the context here is that while these are Jewish Christian communities that we're hearing about in these places, we're really in Gentile country. We're out in the world. We're beyond the doors, right? We're out with the Gentiles. That's us. And unlike many unnamed women in the Bible, Tabitha has two names. Tabitha is her Greek, or I mean her uh, Hebrew, Aramaic name, and Dorcas is her name in Greek. Both names mean gazelle in their respective languages. Now, the fact that she is named and named twice means that she was an important figure in the church at Joppa. But it also means that she probably interacted with the wider community. She wasn't just Tabitha. When she went out to be with the Greek community, the Gentiles, she was Dorcas. Everybody knew her. All the people knew her. And she has one other designation that's given to no one else in all the New Testament. She is called Methatria, which is the Greek word for disciple. It is the feminine version of the Greek word for disciple, and it's used one time in all the New Testament. All those women who followed Jesus, all those women who walked with him, they were not called disciple. So Tabitha, Dorcas, it's kind of a big deal. And she's so beloved in the community that when she dies, they send for Peter. 
who they have heard about, who is on a little bit of a roll healing people. And so he comes and raises her up to continue to do her many good deeds, to serve that community. William Willimon is one of my favorite preachers, and he has this to say about the remarkable discipleship that is lived out by Tabitha and others. Here in this community, no one stays in his or her place. Common fishermen are preaching to temple authorities. Paralyzed old men are walking about and changing lives. And a woman named Gazelle heads a welfare program for the poor at Joppa. We might think that Tabitha is exceptional. And she is in many ways. But even today, even today, the church, this church, is filled with Tabithas. Filled with ordinary people doing extraordinary things, living lives of extraordinary discipleship. They're sitting beside you. They're sitting in front of you. They're sitting behind you. They're singing along with you. They're not staying in their place. Thank you, Gianna not staying in their place. They're stepping out beyond what seems comfortable or possible or expected. They're sewing dresses for girls around the world. They're stocking shelves at food pantries to feed the hungry. They're preparing plates of food for people to share a hot meal. They're making a pot of coffee or a tin of muffins so that we make sure that everyone has a warm and genuine welcome here. They're sharing their gifts by taking on new roles in the life of this church and of the community around us. They are using their time and talent and treasure to create something new. Starting here. Starting now. And then it goes out into the world. They are here, my friends. You are here. We are here all the people. It takes all of us to do this. It takes all of us to proclaim resurrection hope to the world outside, indeed to ourselves, to all the people, using words and actions and language that speak to each one of us, speaking that word of life and love to a creation that longs to hear it. Lifting our voices with all that we are and all that we have in praise. Amen. As we continue in our worship, coming before God in prayer, I invite you, as always, to lift up names and situations that should be in our prayers this day. And if you're worshiping with us online and would like to include a uh, prayer concern in the feed, please do so. Laura.
Mark and Jacqueline. Sharon. Dan and Nancy. Jan, I'm sorry. Jan and Nancy. For Samira. For Tim. For Scott and Jim. For all the mothers out there. For Judy. Jesse and Rachel. Congratulations, Tim. And all grads. Mark. All right, Mark. Congratulations. David. Let us pray. Once again, O oh God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the gift of gathering together. We give you thanks for the gift of music and song. For the joy of being one with the multitude, lifting our voices in thanksgiving. On this day, we celebrate the gifts of motherhood, gifts most fully revealed in you, O oh God, our life-giving, compassionate, loving, nurturing, powerful, forgiving, welcoming companion on this life's journey. We give thanks for mothers who gave us life, who cared for us and taught us for the faithfulness and dedication and encouragement that helped us form to be who we are. But we acknowledge also the sometimes complicated relationship many of us have to this day whether because of long strained relationships or separation, memories of loss or neglect, things said or unsaid, hopes unrealized, dreams denied. In this season of resurrection, of new life, we pray for the reconciling of relationships and the healing of brokenness. We pray for mothers in Ukraine fleeing the terrors of war with toddlers under their arms and all their life's possessions in tow. We pray for mothers burying their children taken by that war. We pray for mothers at our borders, releasing their children to cross alone, desperate for their safety, clinging to the possibility of new life. We pray for mothers struggling to provide their children a safe place to live. Mothers whose children are hungry or thirsty 
we pray for mothers of young black men. For mothers who don't want to be mothers. For peace and justice in our world. We lift up today prayers of healing and wholeness for Mark, for Jacqueline, Sharon, Jan, Nancy, Samira, Tim, Scott, Jim, for Judy and Jesse and Rachel, David, for graduates and soon-to-be graduates entering a new time in their lives. We pray for those whose needs are known to you alone. And we pray for ourselves. Hear these in all our prayers, almighty God, for we lift them up in Jesus' name. He taught us when we pray to be bold and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We have reached the time in our worship when we are invited to respond. For those of you who would like to respond with the financial offering, there are plates on the table as you leave. You can also, uh, if you're online or even if you're sitting in the pew today, you can visit our website and make a safe and secure donation there. But on this day, I also invite you as we listen to the offering that the, our musicians will be bringing today to imagine what other offering you have to bring peace and justice to our world. Let us worship God with our tithes, our offerings, and uh, the promises of our hearts. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us bless our gifts. We dedicate these gifts for the fortification of the beloved community. Let them do justice in the world. Let them be a sign of our belief in the God who saves and heals and sets free. Let these gifts and the works of our hands and feet be a blessing to all in need. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 224, Christ Arose. And now, Holy One, go with us wherever you may lead us. Guide us through the wilderness, protect us from the storm, bring us home rejoicing at the wonders you have shown us. Bring us home rejoicing once again and to our doors. Amen. 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 <laughs>